And my advice is create your own world. Create your own world. world. Now, I was lucky because I had clients. So I'd work with Southwest Airlines and Pepsi-Cola and Mercedes and just different, like, really, really cool blue chip companies and then simpler companies with great people. You know a lot of the corporate clients I got to work with, and you're learning from them. Mm -hmm. So who the heck do I think I am? I'm, like, getting leadership lessons from these people who their companies are paying a fortune to give them leadership lessons. So I was so grateful to create my own world a really good influence outside me on how I wanted to be. So anybody negative in the office, I would learn from. And you helped me with that, BJ, one day. I was really, really upset one day about something in the hallway. And I started talking to you about it, and you said, stop. That train has left the station. And I said, what do you mean? And he's like, he or she isn't even, I'm not going to say if it was a male or female, isn't even thinking of you anymore. And it's almost that analogy, you're drinking the poison, but they're not even thinking of you. He's like, they have, to- they, they have no self-awareness, is what BJ said. This person has no self-awareness. They don't even know they hurt you with that. That train has left the station. I have used that around the world. That was Gail Olofsson, and this is episode 133 of the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. I'm Jess, your host, and we are on a mission to create a better world. Yep, we're still on that mission. Years ago, you know, when BJ and I started to feel this powerful pull towards a big change in our life, it's like we knew something was coming. We just started asking every day, show me how I can serve. Show us how we can serve. We just kept asking. And still today, we stay in this receiving mode so that we can assist those that we are here to assist. And it's just amazing how life can be so effortless when we show up every day and we do the work independent of excuse. And showing up every day to do the work is not the same as this flawed belief system that work has to be hard in order for it to matter. I'm talking about doing work for the love of it. Gail Olofsson, our guest today, is a living example of this type of work. Two words to describe Gail are service and energy. This woman lives and breathes the good of all mindset, and I believe that's because it's the culture of her family. On account of a phone call from Mother Teresa of Calcutta to her dad in Connecticut, the Haitian Health Foundation was born, and as long as I've known Gail, I've known her to travel to Haiti every year. The Haitian Health Foundation now serves over 200,000 people in the city of Jeremy, Haiti every year. BJ and I worked with Gail for years in the corporate world. My office was across the hall from hers, and I can tell you that she always had a donation pile in the corner somewhere, and she had a million things going on. She was always advocating for someone while closing huge sponsorship deals for our corporation. Everything she did and still does, she just executes her whole life with undeniable joy. When BJ and I moved back to Newport after living in Boulder, Colorado, we reconnected with Gail and met up regularly for coffee and like-minded powwows. Gail is the kind of person whose energy is contagious. It's hard not to have a smile on your face when you're with her, even if she does have a crush on my husband. With that said, (laughs) maybe we should just dive in and do it. Internationally recognized speaker, author, career coach, mentor, and university professor, sales and marketing executive, a mom, a wife, and a woman who most certainly is a betterment to the world, Gail Olofsson. Yeah, we're, we're, we're live. live. We're right live, now. girl. We're rolling. <laughs> live from San Diego. <laughs> live from, like live like from a hotel room. Well, I'm here at the IFEA conference in San Diego, and IFEA is International Festival and Events Association. I've been involved with this organization for 25 years. Last year, I had to skip it because it was the same weekend as our boat show. So it feels like family to be back. So when you walk into a room and they're bringing in more chairs because people are standing on the back wall, it feels really, really good. It doesn't feel completely good when you wear the wrong dress because you think you're going to have 40 people and you don't know you're going to be miked because <laughs> so you've got a microphone <laughs> hanging off your lanyard. Um, but I guess what, it, what, what you bring is your energy. And I have to say, I always do one prayer before I go in. I do a couple of prayers, but I'm like, God, let my words be your words. What do these people need to hear? Because I think it's beyond learning corporate sponsorship, which is what I was teaching today. 
I, what I was really teaching is corporate sponsorship, sales in general, is relationships. It's how you treat people. It's yes. leadership. Yes. That's what it is. It's not about the money. The money will come. And, and if my boss would probably roll his eyes and say, oh, the money will come. But here's the deal. If you go out and you do your best, um, the other thing I wanted to teach them is no is not next. That was a big thing. When someone says no, like if you say no to me when I'm selling you whatever I'm selling you, if I'm selling you some eggs, I don't sell eggs. <laughs> we wouldn't but, buy them anyway. <laughs> no, that's true. no. That's true. Wrong, wrong analogy. <laughs> Instead of looking at them at the next meeting or chamber of commerce meeting or you're at a networking reception and they're looking the other way, it's because they said no to me. It's like put them on a no is not next list and invite them to things. And I mean, I'm talking more in sponsorship now because that's what I was talking on today. But when someone says no to you in sales, instead of never talking to them again, if you like that person, be their friend. Get to know them more. You may work with them in the future. You might not. But you're learning something from every transaction. Well, I love that because let's say you get a no in sales, right? Or and a no in life. Yeah, or a no in life. Like you ask that guy out at work mm -hmm. and he says no, right? So. I think immediately what happens is the ego comes in and it's like, oh, I wasn't good enough. I couldn't make the right. sale. Or it goes in from like more of an edgy standpoint of like, oh, well, they're jerks anyway. I don't want them. But if you can just see that underneath it all, that they're, they're just a person. And I think that's what you're so incredibly gifted at is developing relationships because you, at least from my perspective, it doesn't seem like you're intimidated. Like you're just, you see everybody as a person, as somebody who goes home at night and brushes their teeth before they go to bed and has pajamas and they have their favorite socks and their favorite outfit to wear on the weekend, right? That they're just people. And so to create a relationship with them as opposed to having that separator of they're the customer, I'm the seller, and if that doesn't work, then done. Well, I was on the phone with a friend the other day. And he said, you know, Gail, some people collect stamps. Some people collect coins. You collect people. <laughs> I said, I collect people. I said, I just love people. And even today when I was teaching, I'm looking at like the positivity in the room. I'm looking at the people sitting with their hands crossed a little being like, I'm not buying this shtick. I'm looking at some of the people on their cell phones. I said, that's okay. I gave permission. Now, if you're in my classroom of my 99 students at University of Rhode Island, you better not be on that phone. That's for sure. Um, I always say, okay, this is inappropriate on the podcast, but I'll say it anyway. If they're leaning down, looking at their phone in their lap, I'll be like, okay, all right, Jeremy. All right, okay, Jennifer. I hope that's your cell phone you're looking at in your lap or playing with in your lap. <laughs> I'm going to get fired one of these days. But the whole audience laughs, all the students laugh, and then they put their phones away for good for the yeah, rest of the semester. They, they get it. You know, if you can be there for an hour and 15 minutes, be there. But when you're talking with a large group, and you do this too, you, speak, you, do, you teach your meditation, you teach mindfulness to a larger group, a smaller group. I always say, keep your phone out if you want and take what you need. Take three things away. Take two things away. Contribute. Take what you need. I realize people have a life and some people can't get untethered. Right? What I'm getting I'm right now from Gail is like, she doesn't, you don't have like hard limits. No, or judgment. I don't judge anyone on what they're doing. How do you not judge people? Like, is that I just don't something innate know. with you? No, because I used to judge. You worked with me how many years ago? I was so busy judging you, Gail. <laughs> I have no idea. It was a long time no, ago. I would judge. And I, when I think back on that, I'm like, why did I judge? Well, first of all, do we even have time to judge? Can't we just live and look at people? Did we, li did we walk in their shoes? Have we lived their life? Why are we going to judge? Where, where am I coming from to judge someone? I'm not perfect at all. So no, I don't judge. Do you judge? No, I used to. I used to for a lot. sure. Driving Why? Down the road, just Why? Because you want to feel better. You want yourself. You you want you you feel that you're better. You feel that you're higher than. Well, that's than the, ego. The, that's e the, the ego. That's the ego. Ego can be strong. Making you be better, better than or less. No than. one's better. You know, I was thinking that today when I was watching watching how hard people work in this hotel. I got in the elevator with the man pushing in all the dirty towels and the sheets. And he, I said, how was your day? Oh, good, good. I'm like, you work so hard. He's like, very hard. And he, like, he was going to the next floor. I'm doing a little prayer for him because I'm thinking, God bless him. You know, this is his life. Do you think anyone wakes up at five years old and they write in their little diary, dear diary, when I grow up, I want to push sheets around a hotel? Mm -hmm. You know, like not everybody gets the dreams they want to get. And I got my dreams and you got your dreams today. That's, we have them today. We don't know what's around the corner tomorrow. And I said to the audience at the end, and it had nothing to do with the presentation at all, but... When you're in, staying in a hotel like this beautiful hotel, tip the darn maid. Leave a tip on the pillow. 
I mean, I know this is probably getting far off your podcast. No, it's but not. But here's the thing. They're, you are sleeping in the bed they'd like to be sleeping in and not making. And you're going downstairs in the morning and the conference is giving you free coffee. You don't even have to buy your 500, your, what is it, your $5.50 latte. <laughs> Maybe in some places there are $500 lattes. <laughs> but you don't have to buy that. So leave a tip and write a thank you note and say, thank you for doing such a good job. You work hard. Write a note with it. And connecting and making a relationship. And, right. I, and I think one thing that gets really missed is that that is making that is connecting and creating a relationship. They're going to remember that. That's going to have an effect on their day. That we don't have to be face to face to create relationships, to be connected, to be in service, to be grateful that other people exist in this world. That it can be just as simple. And that's something, Gail, that you are so good at. I mean, as long as I've known you. And the interesting thing about you, Gail, is that you're the only guest I think we've had on this podcast that has known BJ and I before we were BJ and Jess. Oh, do you want to go to that story? Because <laughs> that is really good podcast content. Mudslides in Newport. Everybody in Newport knows that story. 90, 1997, I think. Was it 1997? Yeah, somewhere It's about. not 20 years ago. 1997 is when we um, we yeah. started dating, 1997. There were two mudslides, year after year. I knew yeah. BJ yeah. before yeah. Jessica, and yeah. I knew you, his sordid past. Yeah, there was no sordid past. I know, but it sounds I remember good. Saying it sounds to my, good for the podcast. I remember saying to my sister, she said to me, if you... If you, uh, you know, post mudslide party, post hangover recovery, she said, if you don't go out with this guy, you're missing your husband. And I Aww. said, Suzanne, the only benefit I can think of of dating this guy, now, of course, secretly I was in love with him, <laughs> is that I have so many skeletons in my closet, they are overflowing, and his is probably totally empty, and I could store some of mine in his. Did you? That's the only thing I can think of that would work, but... All right, um, first of all, I need you two. Love. And you might have one skeleton. That's about it. So you don't but have But we're always so hard on ourselves, we right? Are. You do not have a closet full of skeletons. I have, I have a couple of And if you do, there's some bodies. sexy ones. I have a couple <laughs> dead bodies behind me, but... But you're, when, you, when you talked about the maid, too, when we're talking about that, it, in, about touching people's lives, like they're touching you, they don't even know it. This was January of 2017. I lost my voice. I lost my voice at a conference called Professional... PMCA, P Professional Managers Conference Association. Okay, this is a conference that's make or break. It's a meeting planners, full of meeting planners. So they're going to hire you when they hear you speak. I lose my voice. I didn't know I lost my voice until my sister called, not understanding the time zone of Austin and Newport, and wakes me up at three in the morning because we talk every morning, my sister and I. So she calls me up and I'm like, nothing came out. Nothing. I just made this little, and I was like, oh. Nothing came out at all. I couldn't talk. So I wait till six and I go down to the little like concierge lounge and I see the woman there and I said, I write down, I need some water and lemon. I'm speaking at 2.45 and I can't talk at all. So I, then I go down and get Advil and I come back up. When I get up to the room, never mind my little cup of lemon, by the time I walk down to get Advil, which I don't even believe in taking stuff, but I help, thought that might help, I get up to the room and there's a pot, a cambro of hot water, ginger, lemon, and a note from Maddie the cook that said, this is my grandmother's recipe for sore throats. I hope that your voice is repaired. The cook had never met me. Mm -hmm. But this woman in the lounge went in and talk, told them this. Gets better. At 2.45, I see one of my friends in the audience. I said, you may have to deliver this for me because I can't speak. <laughs> like I'm writing this down. From 2.45 to 3.55, I got my voice back. And then it went away again for another 24 hours. How's after that for you, amazing? After you delivered the presentation. After I delivered the presentation. And it was the exorcist voice. Hello. <laughs> it's so great to see you all today. But this is where the story gets better. I go up to my room that night. And there is a note from the maid that says, with three, four cough drops there, and says, I hope your throat is feeling better. Now, she didn't. Or, no, I hope you're feeling better. That's what it said. Because there's the Cambros there. And there's a note. So the next morning I wake up and I said, excuse me, did you leave these in my room? Excuse me. You know, she's like, is that okay? And she picks up a clear bag. I guess you have to use a clear bag at a hotel, like a clear purse. She had the cough drops in there. They were her own. What does this woman make? And then she's giving me four of the cough drops. Is that huge? Uh, I'm not surprised. I know Jess isn't surprised because what you, what you yourself put out in the world, you're going to get back. Well, the four so, cough drops to me were huge. But what you put out, all this energy that you put out, all these connections you put out, all these relationships with people, you're just out there giving of yourself and, and making connections and making, you're giving your notes, right? You give, yeah. 
little thank you notes. And this is the one time, one of probably many, that you needed to receive it well, without knowing it. I went back into the room and I have to tell you, I burst into tears because I was so touched by this. And I'm still touched by her. Well, people are touched by yeah. the comments that you leave too, Gail. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come yeah, on. This is not the Gail. Ways. This is not the Gail fan ways, show. <laughs> oh, it, it definitely, it definitely, yeah. and this is actually the Gail show. Oh, it is. Okay. Yes. For this once is, in my life, it's the Gail show. This particular episode is the Gail show. Okay. So there's a couple things I want to get to, but something that I, I really want to dive into is, do you remember when you woke up that day and you didn't have your voice? What was your mindset between the time that you realized you didn't have your voice and standing in, because you took it to the final minute, like you show, you took a shower, you got your mm-hmm. presenter's outfit on, you <clears throat> went down there not knowing if you were going to have a voice. And so this is the unknown that we like to dive into. Do you remember what your mindset was? That when- I was going to disappoint the people who hired me. That was my mindset. It wasn't about, I possibly wouldn't get, I wouldn't get paid. I had spoke the first day, so I pro- would have probably been paid half. That wasn't, that was immaterial. That I would disappoint people. They chose the session. They flew in. It was on um, recreating, I think that was like reinventing your life, like living your life to the fullest, recreating your life at any stage. And I was, I didn't want to disappoint. Now that's arrogant to think I'm going to disappoint. Like, I think that's a little arrogant too, but it was more disappointing the people who hired me that I wasn't going to deliver and the sponsor that was paying for the session. I remember there was a sponsor in the room, Patrick, and I walked up and I said, I'm so sorry if I'm not able to speak, but I have my girlfriend there who said she'll cover for me. And she didn't really know how she was going to cover. <laughs> but we figured I could stand up there, and as she's trying to deliver the slide, I could write it out, and then she could keep talking. So we were going to find some way to do it. Was there trust in there? Because you, yeah, you I knew I was going to get my voice back. I did. That's what I wanted. I just that's did. That's what I wanted. No, again, like, it was a lot of prayer, and I know there's people out there who'd be like, "Oh, she's talking about God so much," but you know what? It's um, there was so much prayer. Even I was texting my mom, "Please pray." And you know what? Then I felt guilty wasting my prayers on something like that when people really need prayer about like they're starving in the world. Yeah, but your prayers there's, are worthy. Yeah, yours are worthy, and so yeah, I think people get squeamish about the God word, and so I want to actually ask you, like, what is God to you? Oh boy, that's, I've never been asked that question. It's like, it's a presence. It's something, it's like he or she, Sister Teresita, my nun friend always says she. Something, it's like this feeling that surrounds me all the time, like a blanket, like a warm blanket of goodness that I feel I can do anything and I feel safe. And if something does happen to me or I had lost my voice and found out, okay, something's wrong with me and I've got three months to live, that's all part of a plan. I wouldn't, I would just realize, okay, it's my time now. And I'd be so, so sad and bummed out, but I trust in everything. Yeah. And God is a higher force to me. Um, I do my prayers so much and talk, but, but God, okay. So I'm here in San Diego. Yesterday I'm at mass at St. John Evangelist Church with this amazing priest, overflowing room. I've never been to a church where you watch you're with a priest on a, like a PowerPoint presentation. He's on another (laughs) screen on an LCD projector. And then two hours later, that was the 8 o'clock mass, two hours later, 9 o'clock mass, two hours later, we're at the Self-Realization Center for a whole other kind of mass, almost cultish. And I, I say that word in a nice way. It was a room full of really nice people, like it was a cult so of did, niceness. <laughs> did you go to, because those that's Yogananda's meditation garden. Yes, went there too. Did you go to too. the temple? We went to a Self-Realization place that was downstairs. Like, I mean, not downstairs. You walked into this building and it was like a little church. Did, okay. And did they Is have the all temple? the pictures on yes. the altar? So they yeah. had Jesus, yes. they had Babaji, they had Yukteswar, they had Yogananda. I, loved it. I love it. Yeah. So it's not, um, it's not Jesus being crucified on like a cross. It's like all these awesome pictures of these great masters. Yeah. And it this, was positive. This it masterful was so positive. energy of all of these masters that channel in the God energy, yeah. that higher power. So God, I think, can be can be called universe. It can be called divine mother. It can be called infinite source. It can be called whatever, my homie. It can be called whatever like you want. Yeah, my God, homie. God's my homeboy. <laughs> my homie. That could be the title <laughs> of my next book. <laughs> oh, that is a t-shirt? Like, <laughs> God is my homeboy. <laughs> you know, oh, I was thinking of other things too. But it's just, to, I totally agree with you. To me, it's um, it's an energy and it's in everything. It's in, it's in the the intelligence of these microphones, mm-hmm. right? It's in everything. It's it's in this room. It's it's in the intelligence of the flow of traffic out there. Like there's 
thousands of cars driving 85 miles an hour and somehow it works. Right. There's an energy out there that's keeping things in flow. And the trust, that like that blind faith that yeah, you're going to... Yeah, it's a blind faith. It is. Oh. And I left thinking from both of those two very opposite experiences, the thing that went through my head is, thank you, God, for your generosity in my life. Mm. Why did I wake up today and I still had my two hands? And I could still walk with my two feet and I could still see and hear and taste and love. Like, why? Why me? Why am I so lucky? And I don't have guilt over that anymore. You know, but, you know, I've been going to Haiti since I was 19 years old. Yeah, let's and, talk about and, Haiti. Well, in volunteering with the Haitian Health Foundation, an organization my mom and dad started. Gosh, well, I don't want to tell the truth about my age. So if I'm, if I started well, at 19, so if I started at 19, what was that? 21 years ago? <laughs> no, I'm actually 50 and holding at this point. Don't tell anyone. Okay. You are actually holding very uh, well aw. because I've known you for over 20 years mm -hmm. and you look exactly the okay, same. Okay. Can we do the podcast every week or every yeah. day? You want, now you <laughs> want it to be video before you're like, they're not going to see me, right? Oh gosh. Well, it's, it's been a long day. I've been talking, I woke up early to talk to my sister. Um, and well, the Haitian Health Foundation, you know, there are no coincidences. And my dad, I'll, I'll flash back to, um, it was my sophomore year at Tufts and I get the call. No one wants to get that your father has one year to live. Two doctors had said the cancer that you have in your bladder, this rare form of bladder cancer, you've got probably about a year to live. One doctor, Dr. Raymond Giddies, who was actually here in California said, you're not going anywhere. Even though he thought my dad was going to die. He still said to my dad, you're not going to go anywhere. I gave him hope. That was fall. That semester was awful. Going back and forth to Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, knowing my dad was going to die. He had promised our Bishop Riley in Norwich, Connecticut, that he would go to Haiti. And that was November. So here he is, bone skinny, recovering from um, cancer, and goes to Haiti. And he starts extracting teeth. He hadn't extracted teeth in 20 years. He's an orthodontist. But in Haiti, you die of dental disease. So he started extracting teeth and for one week with my brother. My brother was actually an OBGYN, so my brother was helping with assisting with delivery of babies and my dad was extracting teeth. He set up camp outside of Mother Teresa's home for the dying. I don't know if you know this about Mother Teresa of Calcutta, but she would go out and take people off the street and have them die in dignity. So she'd bring them into these homes and bathe them and shave them and put lotion and talk with them and feed them and play cards with them and give them dignity. Not, I mean, her sisters would be doing all this in their death. And the sisters noticed my dad and the way he was working with people and his kindness. He's a very loving heart. He's a really good person. And they gave him messages to call mother with. These little messages on, I remember ripped up scraps of paper. They were using everything they had. They were, nothing was wasteful. Almost like the outside of like bottle, um, paper that would be surrounding an aspirin bottle. They had all these messages from mother. And he came home and he called Mother Teresa, actually in Washington, D.C., not in India, with these messages. So a few months later, my dad gets a call from Mother Teresa herself that she wants him to build a clinic in Jeremy, Haiti, and his name is Jeremiah. He's like, Mother Teresa, with all due respect, I've got four kids under the age of 19, and how am I going to build this clinic? And everything came together. The clinic was built. So when Mother Teresa asked him to build... <laughs> Which is a crazy story. It's crazy. We have a whole book on Mother this. Mother Teresa's on the phone. With my dad. D he, was, he had cancer at that point. No, he was in recovery. He was but in he recovery. didn't think okay. he was going to live. I mean, it's April. He's been given a year to live. And she knew because she was... I don't know if she knew that part. No, but she knew that he was supposed to do this because she yeah, was somebody... Yeah, I don't think she knew about the cancer. No, 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 no. no but she's somebody who... Well, she was somebody who, like Jesus, was able to... Um, like identify, identify yeah. with that God energy and get those messages. And this is what you're supposed to do yeah. and basically tasks him with that. And it didn't come together easily, but there are all these different things, the way that it came together. And now the Haitian health foundation serves, provides medical care for 250,000 people in Jeremy, Haiti. And my father's name is Dr. Jeremiah Lowney. And he wouldn't be able to do it without my mom, Virginia. You know, there's a Save a Family program where people pay by the month to send kids to school, clothe them, put them in homes. You can buy a village. You can support doctors. He built a neonatal um, hospital for women in high-risk pregnancies. I shouldn't say hospital. It's more like a resting area where the women's rest before they go to, and have their babies. And they get great nutrition. And they might learn a craft 
that type of thing. And they're, it's, it's like family. They're all together because if the mother dies during childbirth, it's all for women in high-risk pregnancies. When the mother dies, the kids are orphans on the street. So being in Haiti, I only, I only go once a year. Me being in Haiti is from me. It's from my soul. I am not needed there. I'm a volunteer that goes down. I'm not a doctor. I'm a sales professional, you know, but I go down and I'll assist the doctors. That's one of the things I love to do, assist the dentist, helping um, with the instruments and things like that while they pull up teeth. And I have to be honest, I'll usually say to one of the doctors, do you need an off or a Hail Mary or a Memorare over this patient? <laughs> so I am praying over every patient because some of those mouths you are, you are that open, down there. I, I, you know, but where I am needed is back here in the U.S. where I talk, I speak. My book has made over $40,000 at this point, and it's, all that money has gone to charity, 100% of it. I haven't kept one dime of the money from the book. 100%. It's a business model that some people don't understand, but it works. So the, the book has raised money for charity, and it's, that's what I do, is I'll go out and I'll speak for organizations, and I see what comes out of the audience. I never go up to friends and say, hey, can I have 25 bucks? Can I have 100 bucks? It's all about um, doing a little speech about Haiti and then seeing what comes out. And you know what it might be? A tuna or spam drive. We always need tuna and spam or soap or underwear for the kids. My friend Catherine, who's here with me at this conference, she's always, for my birthday, for Christmas, I get children's underwear. <laughs> people are going to, people are going to, they don't fit me. <laughs> people are going to wonder, what's this all about? But she really, it bothers her that these kids sit on the ground and you get ringworm. It's as easy as that. And ringworm's not fun. No, it's to not have, fun. you know, worms in your intestines. So when you've spent since 19 years old in Haiti, don't even think I'm going to wake up and say, oh, I don't feel good today. Oh, I don't want to go to work. I want to get up and live life and see. Because again, you don't have to go to Haiti to help other people either. I love doing things in our backyard. And again, help. Helping other people is helping me. I enjoy it. Don't well, you? I think that, yes, and you know, that's our... That's what you do every single day. Yeah, and, but it's our essence to connect. It is our, is our essence. It really is our essence to serve one another. We are here to take care of one another. I, believe, I, I agree with that. And we're all here just trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to figure this whole game of life out. Yeah. And some of us are a few train stations up and some of us are like with the map, like where the hell's the train station, you know, trying, just trying to figure out how to get onto that landing pad, you know? And so that's why I believe, I really believe that we are all here with gifts and, yes. and yeah. to share those gifts. What do you think your gifts are? Possibly motivating people to live their best life. I would think maybe like I have my, my friends always joke about it. My, when I stand in pictures and I put my arms out high and my legs out high, it's my live your life, love your life stance. I've seen you in that stance. I know. I did it today a few times. I even did it for the audience. But it's like my book title is Your Someday Is Now. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Live right. now. Live down. So I think motivate to love your job. Or if you don't like your job, at least do your job or find one you like. Motivate to help other people. The happiest people help other people. Stop. You're worried about yourself. You're depressed about yourself. And I'm not talking about a chemical depression. That's all different. I'm talking about just if you're like, woe is me and just being upset about something for no reason. Go help someone else. Go help someone else, right? So I would say, when I say my gift, only because other people say it, is, Gail, can I book 15 minutes with you just to get, because I do a lot of coaching. Can I book 15 minutes just to get motivated? Yes, you can. Even though I really would rather do a dollar session. I mean, not a dollar, an hour session. I'll do a 15 minute motivation with people who just throw me the um, question. And that's another thing. My husband and son are like, you can spin anything. You can spin it into a positive thing. My son actually calls me an alien. <laughs> He's like, mom, you wake up in the morning really happy. Then you'll eat something weird like cabbage and banana or whatever, avocado, something in the refrigerator <laughs> and some almond milk. And then you like, you're happy all day. I'm like, well, why? You're happy all day. Why, BJ and Jessica, are you in a good mood all day? Why? We why? choose. It's a choice. Yeah, I guess I it choose too. It comes down too. to a choice. Yeah. Right? You, you can choose to be happy or you can choose. When it all comes down to it, you have a choice. Yeah. Right. We, we talk about this victim mentality. Like you're, it's always like the woe is me. But there like, are victims. There are there people are, who have been are. victimized. But, but if you can, if you can get to the essence, right. If you can get the essence and Sam sees it, right. He sees it in you. Mm -hmm. So he's probably thinking in his mind, you know, I like to be happy. Like I see my mom happy all the time. I'm happy right? because I'm grateful. 
My, one of my friends said to me the other day, you have reckless enthusiasm. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, you, I love that. You want more of that. Reckless enthusiasm? I'm like, really? Am I, this is the first time I've been called reckless in my life. <laughs> but so I loved it. When you're giving motiv- so when you're helping motivate others, yeah. this, is so, this is so key. How do you continue to offer up your enthusiasm, your motivation, but then detach from any expected results? So you speak with that person for 15 minutes. They, they, they leave, they're all fired up, and a week later, it's, it's, they're back. Oh, everyone's on the path, like Jess like said. The path, the train station, I like that. I'm going to have to write that down later when we're at the Cafe Gratitude. I know. We're going to dinner I at Cafe you. Gratitude. You're just like, where should we go? I'm like, Cafe, Cafe Gratitude, Gratitude <laughs> is absolutely where Gail needs to go. So I think they have to come back to that same, maybe have to get off on a different stop if we go on more with the train station. So that was a stop they got off and it wasn't right. And that's okay. But you can always get back on the train. Get back on the train. And but you don't take it personal stuff. at all. Never. It's no. you're, you're putting the work out there. No. You're putting the motivation out there. Not everybody likes it either. I'm sure today there were probably people in there like, oh my God, she's fake. She's not that happy. <laughs> you know? Well, yes, I am. Today, though, it's today again. It's just today. Again. Yeah. So I, we've known you it's for so one long. One day Gail. at a time. And this is like maybe the first time I've really understood because I've seen your office like I've seen the way that you work you just pulled out a folder from like 15 years oh ago God, that BJ and I that worked we on with design with we probably fell Kate in love Whitney's over that kids. freaking folder like, yeah but what was the, what was the Wait, point what's the was point kidding? of like seeing my office my office has a lot of memorabilia yeah what was where was I going with that motivation yeah there was uh, something about that. I love that you forget because you're younger than me so It'll it come. helps me I feel like you were seeing me. something in Gilly you hadn't seen I was before. yes presence yeah. So I see, I see you haven't seen me in two years, and I came home and I stopped in the office, and you see me and you drop everything and, and everything. you talk to me. Yeah. And then, Completely and then all of a sudden, you get an important phone call and you say, "BJ, wait a minute, I need to take this." And then you're present. So, what most people I may would s- only take it if it was important because <laughs> when you come in, I really would. Like, <laughs> but what most people see is maybe, maybe some chaotic energy because you, you've got a lot going on. <laughs> Actually, is you're one hundred percent present with the with so much acuteness to the thing that's directly in front of you yeah. at that moment. Mm-hmm. But you, you're shifting from thing to thing, but you're so focused. Would you would you yeah. agree with that? Like, that's the first time I've really, like... Yeah, but I want to say up. that what we see in others is within us, and yes. your, your, your relationship focused. with presence, BJ, has has your growth there has been exponential in, in the last six months. Mm. And so I think you're seeing that... What you see in others is... Yeah. What you say. Yeah, so, I, yeah, yeah, that's so true. Yeah. Yeah. So we're both just so present. We're but so you, present. but I do, I like. I have to practice presence. But, I do, especially. But I'm in sales. Remember too. So when you're in sales, you have to sit and listen and write things down, and make sure you heard them right. Presence is. I mean, that's another. That's a whole different mm-hmm. kind of presence. Just by nature of what you do, and here are a few things of what you do. You're an internationally recognized speaker. You're an author, a career coach, a mentor, a university professor, sales and marketing executive, a mom, a wife. You serve on advisory boards. You are always collecting clothes and children's underwear. And 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 dead presidents. I like what? dead presidents. That's money. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> collecting money. Yeah. Um, and so For I think that presence... It's like, there's, I don't think there's, there's any way that you could do what you do if you didn't have this skill to be present with the task at hand Mm -hmm. because you have so much going on. Right. And like, that's kind of what's clicking for me right now. You too have so much going on. It's what we choose to have going on. I had all this opportunity. I love having a lot going on. It all came in. I couldn't say no. In my book, I say, say no and say no politely because nobody cares how busy you are. So say a nice no. But it's very difficult for me to say no to the opportunities that are coming. Why is it so difficult? What? what why? Because they're very exciting, and I'm not saying no to if somebody says, "Hey, will you head the silent auction now?" I'm not heading their silent auction because that's not what drives me. You're saying that's yes to the get. opportunities I'm, that bring you joy, and absolutely. excitement. Yeah. If you want me to head your silent auction, I'm going to get you three really, really good. Excuse the French on air, kick-ass prizes. That's yeah, what I'm, you'll that's get like a help. car. So that you can get some serious coin. Mm-hmm. I won't get a car, but I, I have in the past. Yeah, yeah, believe <laughs> me. Did, if anybody can get a car donated, it's you. Yeah. How about the so, flights to Toronto? Oh yeah, yeah. We've we've we cashed have, in on we've, many Gale things. We got a we got free flights skis. to Toronto. We got some kind of ski weekend where we actually were given skis and all this other stuff, and we were hanging out with. Joe Short Sleeve, who was the <laughs> weatherman or something, the newscaster. Anyway, oh, we've, we've cashed in on a lot of your amazing things. I think, when, but when opportunity comes, 
bless yourself and be grateful for it and try it. You know, I, I've added, I don't know if you know this, I have had for four years now a leadership um, show called Leadership at All Levels. I've been on, on the show Broadcasting, twice. And you're coming back on Hello. again. And you're coming back on again, remotely, both of you, because I have to have okay. you back on. You know who I just did an interview with was Trent when I was yep, home. Yeah, outstanding. Over... That's a story. He's outstanding. Yeah, I can't wait to share. That's actually, it's actually, it will be launched by the time we launch this one. But, um, and of course, he's super handsome and... Yeah, it's always nice to not share as hand, the, not as handsome as BJ, and I just said no. that publicly to all the listeners. <laughs> yeah. and I can say that because Gail's your backup. Anyway. <laughs> She's the backup. <laughs> I'm the backup. I'm the backup. Uh-huh. So um, gratitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, since leaving Newport, Rhode Island, and BJ and I literally risking everything. I can't you know? believe what you did. You risking gave away everything. your grandmother's pearls. The only thing I would have done, I'm chastising <laughs> you right now, is I would have sold them to make money for a nonprofit, or I would have given them to but one you know of my what? nieces. I gave them to Big Brothers Big Sisters. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, then you were good. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now I'm, I did a lot. Okay. Wait, I just processed <laughs> that on air. I'm fine with it now. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. We did a lot. You've been hanging on to that. <laughs> I've been hanging on to it. Problem, is it four years now? Two years. Two well, years. I just remembered it today, so I haven't really hung on it. But, you know, to get to the point that you're supposed to get to in America, we could afford our lives. We were putting money in the bank. We could pay a mortgage, yeah. no problem. We had fat paychecks, you know, and all of this. And then to, to give, to walk away from all of I that, that you did move this. into your car. And with Clark. With Clark, of course. Gratitude got really acute for us. So when we were living in a tent in Ithaca, New York, in 97 degrees at night, waking up in the middle of the night doing shifts to like give Clark ice baths because he was so hot, like a glass of ice water was amazing. I can't even tell you, like I can still remember, and I know BJ can too, how amazing it was to get a water with ice in it. So gratitude got really acute, which prepared us for what we were walking into when we moved to California, going 100% in with Yogi Triathlete, building this team of athletes, building this team of, you know, um, you know, working with people with mindfulness and meditation and building the podcast and, you know, going 100% in. Doing the cookbook, which I love. Do, writing my first book, like yeah. all the stuff that we were doing, it was all about gratitude. It was about walking 400 steps down to the beach. That's how close we live to the ocean and being th- thank every single day. Thank you, God. You I'm, count the steps to the beach. That first was the day we, first, first day, day we got that. there. We first day we steps. did. How many steps does it take us to get to the beach? And we were just, that gratitude got so incredibly acute. And I believe that it shifted everything for us. Because if we weren't able to live in that gratitude, I think we would have, we would have, it would have been total annihilation, mm-hmm. financial annihilation. But we created this really, really strong practice of gratitude. Mm-hmm. And the gratitude is, um, it, it's, with the gratitude came a trust that I'm always, I'm always provided for, that I mm-hmm. always have everything I need. Because Would every you time say I, then that you feel there's a God? What's that? Would you say you feel there's a God? Oh. Absolutely. Okay. It's a, it's a presence mm-hmm. that is always with me. The warm blanket. Exactly. I love the way you said that. Mm-hmm. And like you go to church and, and you do your prayer. I do meditation and I do mantra, which mm-hmm. mantra is similar to prayer. It's very much the same. It's just a different word to describe it. And so I get in touch with that God essence that's within me, the God essence that created me, mm-hmm. right? That's within me. <laughs> So that's that's my church is every day sitting in meditation and and cultivating that relationship so that that warm blanket is just always there wrapped around me when I need it the most. So that was our story in creating gratitude. But how would you say is a way to create more gratitude in life and how important is gratitude to um to living your life to the to its fullest. Well, I go back to someone I'd love to meet someday, Oprah. I love her. <laughs> I love really, Oprah. She has a house right, but in Rancho oh, Santa Fe. Kidding me. You're and my so cousin close. was yeah. her bodyguard years ago. My cousin. You got to tap into that. I know he's not her bodyguard connection. anymore. I know. I. You know what? Maybe just reading about her and learning about her is enough. And now that she's right here, oh my gosh, now I'm really excited to be here. (laughs) I just love her. And even before she did gratitude journals, my mom was like that. We'd have to say what we were grateful for, you know, and we'd have, we could always had to focus on the positive growing up. I remember we were traveling once and we forgot our coats and she's like, well, you wanted to pack your own suitcases. You forgot your coats. She was only mean for about a half hour. Then she got us coats. But I remember like being really cold. If she taught us lessons in a really warm, gentle way, but she taught us mostly about being grateful for everything we had. 
And I think that when you wake up and you do focus on that, and I don't do the, what Oprah suggests, I do teach it in my audiences, the sit down and write every night five things you're grateful for. And then the reason why is what I added to that, why? Not just the five things you're grateful for, but why are you grateful for them? Write that right next to it. I haven't done that, but I was thinking the other day I probably should, and then like reflect back on the journal 30 days later to see what repeats. Yeah. Have you done that? Have you sat down and physically no, but written I have, it down? I have a daily gratitude practice, but I want to know, do you, do you have a daily gratitude practice or is it just I that- wake up out of my bed and I'm so happy to get up. Again, I, I hate to repeat this, but it's so true. And I shouldn't say hate. That's such an awful word. Um, I you re- love to repeat I love it. to repeat this. <laughs> my feet hit the ground. I mean, I don't even need the alarm to go off, even though I program the alarm. I, my feet hit the ground. I'm psyched to get up. I'm psyched to go for a walk. I know I'm going to talk to my sister on the phone because she lives in Connecticut. So she's a state away. And then I'm going to read my book a little bit because I love reading my book on tape and then go into work. And I wasn't doing this as religiously as I'm doing it now because there was so much work to do mm-hmm. and I had to get in. And if I wasn't in by eight o'clock and now I get in when I'm in and I'm much more productive because I start the day doing what I need and that's being healthy. Well, that's what, what the I most need. successful people do yep. in this world. They, in those morning hours, they're not returning emails and things like nope. that. They're, they're focusing on themselves. Right. And I used to be the person who got up and I would do email at five o'clock and I'd be answering all these emails. Why am I going to work at five o'clock? Why? And how, and how clear is your head at, at five o'clock in the morning? Like not how, very. Well, right. mine, mine actually is okay, but it's, but you're in. You're but not well. It will banging out emails. No. Like, if I can just get this one done, this one done. But and it's so peaceful to just start because my sister's very David G. I don't know if you David know David G. Mm-hmm. He's a big guru out here in San Diego, um, Chopra Center. Mm-mm. Oh yeah, David G. J. I. So she's really into him. Mm-hmm. Louise Hay. David G. and Jess G. Yeah, she's like the that. other. I like that. Jessica in Gomez. San Diego. Yes. Oh, and she's bigger. And um, who else? Wayne Dyer, who passed away, who I love. So oh, I love Wayne Dyer. Love. So she's all into this. So we'll have our our morning conversations that are so positive. Yes. So you, I start with a positive person, then I'll read my little book, then I go into a positive workplace. I've been at Newport Harbor Corporation for thirty years. Our president, you know, our president Paul O'Reilly, one of the most positive people I know. You know what he does, and I love this. Both of you do it too. He laughs to his eyes. So when he laughs, his eyes close or they get really like happy. <laughs> and I love people when they smile or laugh or smile and they're, they smile to their eyes. I don't know if you understand what that means. We actually were talking about eyes. this yesterday Laura. with one of yeah. our athletes yeah. about yeah, It's yeah, like a real, ha- so you go to work with people who appreciate you. Who has that? I think there's a lot of people who don't. But how do... Okay, so let's say they don't. Let's say they're in a workplace that they're just not really jiving with. Um, their boss does not smile, not mm-hmm. even with their eyes. How do they start creating gratitude in a space like that? Um, I have had that in jobs. I've even had it in my 30 years at Newport Harbor where there's been some challenges when we made some bad management hires. And my advice is create your own world. Create your own world. World. Now, I was lucky because I had clients. So I'd work with Southwest Airlines and Pepsi-Cola and Mercedes and just different, like, really, really cool blue chip companies and then simpler companies with great people. You know a lot of the corporate clients I got to work with, and you're learning from them. Mm-hmm. So who the heck do I think I am? I'm, like, getting leadership lessons from these people who their companies are paying a fortune to give them leadership lessons. So I was so grateful to create my own world of really good influence outside me on how I wanted to be. So anybody negative in the office, I would learn from. And you helped me with that BJ one day. I was really, really upset one day about something in the hallway. And I started talking to you about it. And you said, stop. That train has left the station. And I said, what do you mean? And he's like, he or she isn't even, I'm not going to say if it was a male or female, isn't even thinking of you anymore. And it's almost that analogy, you're drinking the poison, but they're not even thinking of you. He's like, they have, to- they, they have no self-awareness, is what BJ said. This person has no self-awareness. They don't even know they hurt you with that. That train has left the station. I have used that around the world. <laughs> Stop, the train has left the station. What does that mean? I, meant some, I don't even know. I translated it really well, but how would you tell the audience what does the train has left the station mean? So, so we can get caught up. We can get caught up in, let's just say the train has stopped. We can get caught up in everything about it. Or we can choose to send, spend our energy on the things that really matter because that train is leaving. It's going to leave at some point and it's gone, right? So the train is gone. You're sending energy to, to continually follow that train. And, it, well, this, and well, no, but past. this was a person who was sabotaging me at the time. Right. And yep. you can't go cry to daddy, to the, your boss. Oh, huh. I'm getting sabotaged. Like, you know, that doesn't work. You're not in grade school. Yeah, it's not, and it's also... And it was not, still, the sabotage was still going on. 
but you wanted me to release it and right. just let the train go. It's not go. what happened to you. It's what you do about it, right? Yeah. So this was happening to you and you had the opportunity, Gail, to... To, to indulge in it, right? And yep. to, to fester on it. And to I would have like, if I hadn't stopped you in the hallway and you were like, why aren't you smiling? Yeah, <laughs> PJ was like, what's going on? Why aren't you smiling? I'm like, oh, you're not going to believe this. And I trusted you. I don't think in the workplace you should ever talk about somebody else. That's wrong. But I trusted PJ. I don't think if I'm mad at Jessica in the workplace, and we had our arguments years mm-hmm. ago. I hate that we had our arguments, but it brought us here now. I don't, well, know, that know, I don't, I know, I don't even know what we argued about, to be honest. I, I was a different person back then. We and I'm so were. grateful for we that girl were. because it shows me where I've come. And, oh my and I gosh, love her because I love, that. I love right. her so much because when I see people who are suffering, right? When I see people who are intolerant of other people, when I see people who are judging, I can now look at them and say, yeah, I've been there too. Yeah. Like I've been there. And, and I wasn't happy there. Like I was... I, yeah, I wasn't happy when I was in that space. I mean, I've always been like you. I grew up like in a cocoon of love. Right. I grew up with parents that said, you can be whatever you want to be. You can marry whoever you want to marry. You want to marry a girl. You want to marry a guy. You want to marry somebody who's green. We did who's too. Blue, My mother like, said, bring home black, white striped or polka dots. <laughs> yeah, like, polka dots. Marry, not polka dots. Because they would be like, God <laughs> that loves. That nuts too. God loves everyone. And right. And loved but, you they, too. but we're older and, and people weren't like that back then. So we right? both had parents that said that. Yeah. I mean, my mother was always, don't sweat the small stuff. The present moment's the only thing. I mean, from the day I was born, it was just ingrained in me to, to always choose that higher frequency, to always choose the, the positive, you know, even, and not, not always did I, right? Like, so there was times where I suffered and there was times where I was judgmental. And, but I think, you know, I'm really grateful, like I said, for that person that I used to be because it shows me how far I've come. It shows me what's possible, which is anything. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe that we're hardwired. I believe that we're marvels of change. I've really been like marinating in this on this idea that we're marvels of change, that nothing, that this evidence-based way of living, I'll believe it when I see it. I don't feel like it's relevant anymore. And I like There's what too you're many saying people there. doing amazing things. Right. For for people who are struggling in their work life too. That's going to help. What you just said there too is I love this expression. I have to I wrote it down because it's going to be a chapter. So grateful for that girl. So when you're in the workplace and you have someone who's oppressive or somebody that you're working with that you just they're toxic. They can't help it. Again, it's that they're awareness. They're suffering. They, they don't even know their impact. They don't know. They that. don't have the tools either. No. I'm looking at it now. It's like a lot of people yeah. just don't have the tools to get out of their own way. They just don't yeah. have that. They were not given that. So go into the work and do your job. And I always tell my interns and my students this, and my friends who are suffering in their job, take stuff off your boss's desk, especially if you have a great boss. What can I do for you? What can I take off your desk? And don't be too big in your shoes to take something off somebody, a direct report or someone who's assisting you's desk. I've worked with people who aren't going to file the file. I'm like, are you kidding me? You're going to hand the file to someone else to file? <laughs> get up and just, it's good exercise to get up and file the file. <laughs> it clears your head. No, not everybody is going to file their files. I'm sure there's people super busy, but I'm never going to let someone file my files. I can file my own. There's things that you can, you can do. And help people. Hey, I see you're having a rough day. Let me help you stuff those envelopes. Let me help you with something. It takes 10 minutes. We stop and we talk in the hallway for 20 minutes. We can help a colleague at their desk for 10, right? Yeah. Well, and I think that those are, to me, that's what makes you such a great leader is that you're not above anything. You always have what what we would call a beginner's mindset. Oh, love it. Yep. Like you're always mm-hmm. learning, right? When we become the expert, and I know we use that word, you know, to just like when people do write-ups, I'm sure people have referred to you as the expert, but I don't think you consider yourself an no. expert. I opened today's session. It was called Sponsorship Then and Now, 30 years ago. And it's really sales then and now, 30 years ago and now, with Harry Truman. It's what you learn after you know it all that really counts. Exactly. And I said to the audience, I don't know everything about sponsorship. I don't know anything about sponsorship because it's changing everything. And I do. Of course, I know stuff about sponsorship, but it's changing the whole landscape mm-hmm. Of sales and marketing and digital and AI and data, all this stuff you understand. <laughs> no. Or maybe no. did at one point. <laughs> or maybe did at one point. And do we want to? <laughs> and do we want to? Right. No. no. So that's, I love learning. And I'm here at this conference, but I'm attending so many other sessions to learn. And I'm standing in the hallway and learning from other people. 
What do you think are the qualities of a leader? Communication is huge. We can always, I teach communication and I think there's that adage, you teach what you need to learn most. I need to learn to communicate. We were just talking about this Mm -hmm. in the car on the way here. Listen more. I talk over people, not to say what I do wrong, but I I get so excited. Now I will be talking over both of you at dinner tonight because it's you and we're going to like be into that. But I've really learned to like reel it back when with your clients, wait till they finish or friends or younger kids, like that are talking to you, students. Don't project what you think they're going to say next. So really, really listening. That's, you know that I listening. Think that's, that's, presence. I think yeah. that's presence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Listening to hear and understand versus listening to speak. That's, you know, leadership, developing trust to the best you can in people, you know, developing and trusting others too. Um, and then there's push-pull leadership, which I think Warren Bennis, um, who was, again, California professor, coined, leadership professor from years ago. People become a leader like I remember when I became the manager of the ice cream store when I was 17, you all listen to me now, I'm the manager. <laughs> I don't think I said that, but I sure acted like that. That's push leadership. I became the boss, so you have to listen to me versus pull leadership. I think about so many different bosses I've had, those I've liked and those that I've been like, hmm, about. But I've always also gravitated to other people in the company that I've worked with or clients. They pulled me towards them and I liked their leadership. So it didn't have to be the person I was directly reporting to. So people who pull you towards them just because of the way they act. I think of people like our president, Paula Riley, and I think of Casey Riley, our COO at Newport Harbor Corporation, two people that they pull you in. You, BJ, you pulled people in. A lot of people came to you because they knew they weren't going to be judged, and they knew if they told you something, one, you were going to completely divert it. So you weren't going to feed into it. And two, you were going to never tell anyone else. You might have come home and told Jess, but I don't even think you'd waste your time on that or the energy on that. Because why? It's not important. Like it's just so yeah. non-important. And you would, that person would leave you feeling better because they were able to just vent it for a minute. And then they didn't even need to vent with you anymore because you, what is the little statue you had on your desk? Ganesha. What is Ganesha? He's, he you remo- would explain he's the Ganesha remover of to all people. obstacles. Yeah. yeah and see, so I forgot about Ganesha. I need a Ganesha. <laughs> you need a Ganesha. What happened to Ganesha? <laughs> we, we left it somewhere. Oh my gosh, you need another oh, Ganesha. Oh, we left it at one of the places that we stayed at because they actually needed to... They needed the obstacle needed removal it. more than we We have did. a big Ganesha now outside oh, our right. little Yes, studio. outside our, our little studio, we have a little Ganesha. So every time you walk by it, it's like it's the yeah, remover so, of obstacles. So I always had that under my screen. And you had that right there. And then people would be venting to you about something and they'd look at Ganesha. And then you'd explain Ganesha <laughs> and everybody was fine. Yes. <laughs> like Ganesha was kind of leading the company. <laughs> Whenever I work with people and, you know, they're one of the biggest things that I work with people on is like, now these people are adults and they're going to a family event, yeah. right? And so I love my family. I have a very, very strong family. Like we get along, we're buddies, but we're family, right? Mm-hmm. So there's things like they're, I look at them all as like my gurus, right? And so I always tell my the clients that I work with, like nothing will change the subject quicker than if you drop into like a child's pose, which is just like a really restorative While you're talking yoga. talking to people? Yeah. Well, if things are getting heated with the family. You just do that? Just drop into a child's pose. <laughs> and now everybody's talking about yoga. It's like the Ganesha, right? Like they come because they want to complain and they're like, what's that? Right? It's like yeah. the diversion. It's like now everybody's talking about yoga. Oh, well, that's a restorative pose. Oh, and that's my favorite pose because yoga and me are not really good friends. We'll talk about that in another session. Don't what? Right. This because is the Yogi Trialty Podcast. Because I haven't had a <laughs> yoga instructor like you. The only classes I've gone into, I think they were too advanced. Like they expect you to know every move. And it's like, okay, now take your left ankle oh, and could twist it around less your head. I what your pose looks like. Does, yeah. right. It's no, all about what's going on. I don't even know to do it. Because they say what the name of the pose is, but then I'm looking at everyone else to figure out what it is. I'm just going to the wrong class. I'll get to the right class. Yeah. I'll get to but the it's class not about the pose. And so... I like child pose. Yoga <laughs> is about... Child's pose is about... Child's, child's pose, pose and shavasana mm-hmm. at the end. Mm-hmm. But yoga is about the relationship like the yoga class in your mind. Yoga is about what's happening within that pose. Are you thinking about it? Are you thinking about, are you, am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? Am I, am I, oh, I'm not flexible enough. Oh, that girl looks great in her pants. I don't look that great in these pants. And so it's all of that. It's noticing the tendencies of the mind. It's noticing, are mm-hmm. we in that, are we in that God essence or are we in that separateness? Right. And so that's really kind of the essence of yoga. Like, are we aligning with all that is, or are we, are we aligning with our aloneness that we're separate in this world? Because that's really, I think it all boils down to two questions. Are we separate or are we connected? We're connected. We're connected. Mm-hmm. And when you believe that, beyond doubt, 
you'll never feel alone. Mm -hmm. But that takes, it takes, for me, it took some cultivating. Like I remember driving up Broadway, you know, up the, before they did the beautification process, um, project like by city hall. And, you know, you've got like the homeless people and then you've got like the wealthy people. Newport's got everything. And I remember driving in the car and just being like, we're the same. We're the same. Mm -hmm. We're the same. Everybody I would look at, we're the same. We're the same. And it didn't make sense at first, but the more I did it, it was like, you can change your brain. You can start understanding intellectually that we're connected. Then you start by listening when somebody's speaking to you. And you can, and I feel like there's, you can feel under the words of, mm-hmm. of their pain or their excitement or their joy. Um, but in the end, like we are all, we are all just connected and, and moving through this same world and our, our struggles are exact in their essence. They might look different in the way that we write them down. But what have you learned about speaking to so many people over all the years, people who want to learn from you that maybe want to be where you are? I mean, I know that I've done lots of little sessions with you to talk about public speaking and moving in that direction. What have you learned about that connectedness that you see in your audience members and the students that you teach and the corporate sponsorship, um, you know, the the conference rooms you've been in? What have you learned about that connectedness that we have? Well, that's such a good question because when you talk about even the speaking, I didn't even expect that I was going to be speaking like this, (laughs) like all like so much all over the place and on so many different topics, the leadership, the time management, positivity, which is my very favorite one. And what do I expect? You're saying, what do I experience when I'm there? I'm, what have you learned about like I'm us lear- being connected, like our connectedness, what I'm learning this oneness? Is how much when I'm speaking to an audience and getting information back from them, getting them to share their opinion of what I'm teaching, we're all learning so much and we are connected. I see that there's a lot of pain and a lot of joy, but the pain can be quickly alleviated and unless again, like we talked about, it's something deep inside. You know, I lost my aunt to depression. She died of depression. So I can understand there's things that happen with people. Um, but when we're, now I lost my story of thought because I'm thinking of my wonderful Aunt Joan. I just put her name on a rock in the Peace Garden in mm. San Diego the other day. Whoever that Peace Garden lady is up by Encinitas, I want to meet her. <laughs> I should have taken a picture of her mailbox to say how much just being in her presence mm. meant. In the audience, the connectedness is again, I walk in, like I said, I say, let God, let my words be your words. Thank you for getting me to this point because it could be stopped tomorrow. There, what if people, um, you know, I don't do any advertising. So people come out of the audience and say, can you come to my conference? Can you come to mine? Can you come to my office? It's a blessing, I think. And we're all connected because we're all searching. We're searching to learn more. We're searching to find ourselves. We're searching to, um, gosh, be more grateful, be more happy, right? I mean, I'm always searching for more education. I just like learning about things and learning about people. Well, that's the beginner's mindset. Yeah. That's, that's the and essence of it. And when the audience starts either breaking into groups by accident or speaking, then someone else raises their hand and says, I love that point or I disagree with that point. It's like a connection. And then I start, I'm going to say this, I start to feel a little like Oprah. <laughs> 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 and I come out with my microphone and I look for a Gail, her best friend in the audience. So I'm like, I'll be Oprah, you be Gail, because I can't, sometimes I can't run around as fast. So I'll give BJ a microphone and say, hey, you're Gail, I'm Oprah. And you run around and like get the comments of what people are saying. So I channel a little Oprah in there, because if there is a person who's defied all the odds and is so connected to life and such a real organic, true person that everybody wants a piece of, um, did I just like switch from being connected to my love for Oprah? <laughs> <laughs> it all comes, all comes back, back to Oprah. Oprah. It all comes back to Oprah. All right, I've got one more question and then okay. we're going to wrap it up. Um, do you think there's a, a difference between being a leader and being a master? So between leadership and mastery? Oh, I don't profess to be a mastery and I don't really know any masters to be honest. I don't. And in self-professed masters... I don't even think, would Oprah even consider What's mastery herself a master? To you? What's mastery? Yeah. Well, maybe I'm saying mastery the wrong way. Maybe I'm thinking, I'm thinking of mastery as arrogance. Mm. Should I not be thinking that way? Like Ma- someone, when you're, they're the great master. Am I thinking of it the wrong way? Well, what's mastery to you? I don't think there is mastery. I don't think you learn everything about a subject, a topic, or life. I don't think you do. I don't think anyone does. 
Is that is that negative? Is that no, a, yeah. no. Because I think of myself as a positive person. I don't think we ever master. You know, was it Malcolm Gladwell with the ten thousand hours, hours, and then you're an expert? But then people have challenged that. If you go online, you'll. I forgot which author challenged it. I don't want to say the wrong one. Um, I mean, but this man is a smart man. He studied this. So again, there's no right or wrong. They both feel the ten thousand. But I think yeah. if there's ten thousand hours of experience, but how good were you in that experience? If I play the piano for ten thousand hours, I'm not going to be you know, the best pianist in the world. I'm going to probably still play the way I play. So mastering, I just, I, we're always learning. But I think that's what makes you a master. Oh, wow. Because I might be the first master in the world. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, it was once, once oh. said to me that, you know, to say I don't know is one of the highest levels of spiritual intelligence. Hmm. Yeah, then I have a lot of masters in my life. Because I have so many people with such humility who I think know so much and they're so smart. And I smile when I see people who are the proclaimed masters, <laughs> even, yes. the, even the ones that like aren't out there in the world. Like they, Again, I gravitate and I admire the people like Oprah who have humility. Who else has humility like that, like Oprah's famous people with humility? Oh, my gosh. I feel like so many people are opening up now. Like I even yeah. just watched this talk with Matthew McConaughey about how like when he stopped putting demands on this movie has to be win an award I have to be nominated by this age I have to do all this stuff when he stopped putting all this pressure on the expected result of his work he moved into a state of joy once he hmm. stopped looking for things that brought he thought would bring him happiness he realized that the joy was just in the moment that he was living that he was doing his craft and that that's what he was always meant to do. What a great way to finish because we're all doing our crafts the best they are, whatever they are. Like my craft, I, I'm speaking, but I'm not speaking really for the dollars. That's great. The dollars are great. But I'm speaking to see who am I going to influence and who's going to influence me and what experience am I going to have on the road right from that maid at the Austin JW to the people here today. Like what's the experience I'm going to have, right? It's all about experiences, and I'm so fortunate not wood, to have positive ones, but I still have negative ones, but they roll over more now like waves. I don't harbor them. I don't hold them. And it's funny because we have 1,500 employees now at Newport Harbor Corporation, and I was there when we had 12 or 20, and I don't think there's one person I don't like. And I'm sure there's a lot that I aggravate. <laughs> but That's I, not for you to worry about. I, it's not, I love that. It's not for me to worry about. Right. I, there's not one person, and today in the audience, I'm looking at people and I'm smiling and I'm having such a good time. One of my friends always says, Gail, when you speak, you have such a good time. <laughs> You're just having fun. And I'm looking and I'm not, I'm okay if someone writes a bad survey. It's them. Right, it's because them. you are in joy. Yeah, you're yeah. doing the work for it's the okay. sake of the work, yeah. not for the okay. And this, what I do want, what really does mean a lot to me is in the classroom, I want to make sure every one of those students, because they're suffering a lot, they are. This generation right now, 2021, 20, the angst, and then the kids behind them, um, their little brothers and sisters, with again, with the um, all the social media and all that was out there that wasn't out there when we were younger. It's good and it's bad. So I look at, and I'm hoping that my, the hour in my classroom we can all have what the Yiddish call mishpuka, family. And we can be together as a family and not judge each other. I mean, even now, with you have to go through sensitivity training for the he, she, they. And one young person came up and said to me the other day, I'm really grateful that you say they because I'm transitioning right now. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to talk to you about it another time because my family's being very accepting, but I'm still being bullied. I said, I'd love to sit and just learn your whole journey. This aura that came off I don't want to say the name, this, this person, and I don't know if it was he going to she or she going to he, it's your material, it doesn't matter. I loved this person. I saw, wait, God, I hate to say this, but I saw God in that person. It makes me want to cry now. And I'm like, okay, if I'm seeing God in this person, that is a warm, there is a warm blanket that's around me every day. Okay, don't make me cry. Oh, I think that's a <laughs> you beautiful brought me to tears. Place to that's a beautiful place to end. And now we're going to finish off our evening at Cafe Gratitude. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. such a beautiful being. I'm so glad to finally have Gail on the show. Thanks for tuning in, you guys. Thank you, Elizabeth, who was our latest supporter on Patreon. We are at 25% of our goal and we're getting there, you guys. Thank you. 
official Yogi Triathlete gear store is now open through Friday, November 30th. We want to get that open and closed so we can get our gear. So if you're looking to have some superpowers for your training and racing next year, then check out the gorgeous gear that was designed for Yogi Triathlete by Own Way Apparel. Link for this is in the show notes for the blog post, so don't miss it. Uh, let's see. We've got signed copies of the Yogi Triathlete Cookbook, High Vibe Recipes for the Athlete Appetite. They are in stock here. You can get those on the website. And do I really have to say it? I mean, giving the gift of health is very much the best holiday gift you can give someone. So check it out. And that's it, peeps. We'll catch up with you next week with another guest who is crushing it in the world in their unique way. And that's what I love most about sharing stories. Despite what we are conditioned to believe, there is no right way. There is no one way. Each of us has our very own path to walk and no one can walk it but us. What we avoid will hang around until we face it, and what we fear will keep us from living as long as we allow it. All we have is right now to make the change we desire to see. And as our guest today would ask you, what are you waiting for?